This lecture will be on alcohol use and abuse. I would like to begin by discussing the risk factors for alcohol use and abuse. Age-related risk factors include late teens to early to mid-twenties and late thirties, where the majority of alcohol-related disorders develop. Environmental risk factors include cultural attitudes towards drinking and intoxication, availability of alcohol, acquired personal experiences with alcohol, stress levels, and heavier peer substance use. Genetic risk factors include the following. The rate of alcohol use and abuse is three to four times higher in close relatives of individuals with alcohol use disorder. There's a higher rate in monozygotic twins than dizygotic twins. There's a three to four times risk in children of alcoholics even when given up for adoption. Comorbidities include bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, antisocial personality disorder, severe anxiety, and depression. In general, men who drink more than four drinks per day or 14 drinks per week are at risk for alcohol abuse, and women who drink more than three drinks per day or seven drinks per week are at risk. 40% of Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and related groups have an aldehyde dehydrogenase deficiency. This is related to a lower risk for alcohol use disorder. Depression is often present. Alcohol use increases the risk of suicidal behavior and completed suicide. The majority of interfamilial homicides involve alcohol. Alcohol is a major factor in rapes and other assaults. Alcohol, or ethanol, also known as ETOH, is a sedative, anesthetic, and central nervous system depressant that increases the concentration of gamma-aminobutyric acid, or GABA, which is a major inhibitory pathway in the brain, and inhibits N-methyl-D aspartate, or NMDA receptors, which are major excitatory pathways in the brain. Once ingested, alcohol is absorbed by the stomach and small intestines. It's widely distributed throughout the body. Alcohol is metabolized in the liver, where 95% of it is metabolized at a rate of approximately one ounce of alcohol per hour. The alcohol is then excreted by the kidneys, skin via sweat, and through the lungs. Alcohol is broken down by the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase in the stomach and liver into acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is then converted into acetate by acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Coenzyme A, or COA, then binds with acetate to form acetyl-CoA. Niacin, or vitamin B3, is required for this conversion and functions as nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD, which receives hydrogen atoms from the enzymes that oxidize alcohol. Acetyl-CoA molecules are blocked from getting into the TCA cycle by the high levels of NADH. Instead of being used for energy, the acetyl-CoA molecules become building blocks for fatty acids, which then become fats or triglycerides. Alcohol affects the brain in a predictable pattern. The first area, which is the most sensitive and first to be sedated, is the frontal lobe. This results in impaired judgment and reasoning. The second area to be affected is the midbrain. This causes alterations in speech and vision. The third area to be affected is the cerebellum. Cells responsible for voluntary muscle control are located here. These are involved in speech, hand-eye coordination, and limb movement. This typically results in the stagger and slur that you see when intoxicated. The final area to be affected is the pons and medulla oblongata. Usually the individual passes out at this level. Here there are brain centers that control heart rate and respiratory rate. These areas are anesthetized by alcohol. Polyuria occurs when intoxicated because of antidiuretic hormone depression. This leads to increased water loss and mineral loss, leading to polydipsia and dehydration. Other manifestations of alcoholism include weight gain and increased body fat. This mainly presents as central obesity. Metabolically, alcohol is just as efficient as fat in promoting obesity. 
one ounce of alcohol equals approximately one ounce of fat. It's important to note that triglycerides, LDL, and homocysteine lead to heart disease or cardiomyopathy. Increased gastric acid secretion and increased histamine lead to inflammation particularly in the stomach and esophagus, leading to gastritis, esophagitis, ulceration, and GERD. Alcoholism is the most common cause of pancreatitis. The metabolism of alcohol and spasm at the sphincter of Adi all lead to autodigestion of the pancreas. Peripheral neuropathy and myopathy present as muscular weakness, paresthesias, decreased peripheral sensation, and pain. These are due to the direct results of vitamin B deficiencies, especially thiamine. Alcoholism results in a variety of vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Folate converts the amino acid homocysteine to methionine. Because of the deficiency, there's an increase in homocysteine, which is linked to heart disease. A decrease in methionine is associated with slowed production of new cells, especially in the intestines and blood. This is implicated in colorectal cancer. Thiamine is a cofactor for enzymes involved in glucose metabolism. When a glucose load is paired with thiamine deficiency, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome occurs. Acetaldehyde dislodges B6, or thiamine, from the binding protein so that it is destroyed. Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome is characterized by altered mental status and delirium, which occurs two to three days after admission with associated nystagmus or oculomotor palsies. Magnesium is required for transformation of thiamine into thiamine pyrophosphate. So magnesium deficiency can promote thiamine deficiency. A low magnesium is generally due to malnutrition and chronic diarrhea associated with alcoholism. This occurs in 30% of patients hospitalized for alcohol abuse and 85% of patients going through DTs. Alcohol metabolism can permanently change liver cell structure, impairing the ability to metabolize fats, resulting in a fatty liver. This progresses from a fatty liver to a fibrotic liver, which ultimately becomes a cirrhotic liver. The liver has difficulty generating glucose from protein without gluconeogenesis. Therefore, a decreased concentration of glucose results. This leads to central nervous system damage. Alcoholic ketoacidosis, or AKA, is a complication of alcoholism that occurs in chronic alcoholics appearing one to three days after heavy binge drinking. There are three proposed mechanisms of alcoholic ketoacidosis. One, decreased nutrient intake leads to an increase in acetyl-CoA, which leads to an increase in ketones. Two, hepatic oxidation of ethanol generates NADH, thus you have an increased concentration in hydrogen ions. And three, dehydration impairs ketone excretion in the urine. The patient experiencing alcoholic ketoacidosis usually presents with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypoglycemia. Labs reveal an elevated anion gap, ketones in the blood and urine, and this usually appears after a period of binge drinking. The management of AKA includes infusion of dextrose-containing solutions and electrolyte replacement and thiamine supplementation. This typically resolves in 24 hours with appropriate treatment. Four mechanisms associated with alcohol ingestion lead to a wide anion gap metabolic acidosis. One is a decreased pH because of an increase in the concentration of hydrogen ions. Two is a decrease in bicarb. Three, an increase in ketones. And four, lactic acidosis. The excess hydrogen ions from alcohol metabolism are taken up by bicarb. This is then converted into carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is then converted to water and CO2. The water is excreted by the kidneys and the CO2 by the lungs. Because bicarb is busy managing the hydrogen ions from alcohol, the balance is upset and the anion gap widens. Because of the excess acetyl-CoA and inhibition of the Krebs cycle, Lactic acid conversion is a more favorable pathway for energy. The excess NADH and hydrogen ions are used to convert 
pyruvate into lactic acid by way of the enzyme lactic dehydrogenase. Lactic acid serves as an energy source, but also contributes to metabolic acidosis. Alcohol withdrawal leads to the opposite effect as alcohol ingestion, with decreased GABA and increased NMDA. Symptoms are also caused by dehydration, hypoglycemia, and accumulation of lactic acid and acetaldehyde in the blood. A hangover is a mild form of alcohol withdrawal, occurring four to six hours after ingestion leading to nausea, vomiting, gastritis, headache, fatigue, diaphoresis, polydipsia, restlessness, irritability, and tremors. Minor withdrawal occurs 6 to 12 hours after the last drink and lasts 48 to 72 hours. Major withdrawal occurs 2 to 3 days after the last drink and lasts 3 to 5 days and is characterized by hallucinations and seizures. 5% of patients with alcohol withdrawal experience delirium tremens, or DTs. The onset of DTs is 72 hours after the last drink, lasting three to five days, but up to two weeks. The mortality rate of this is five to 15%. Risk factors for DTs include prolonged drinking history, prior episodes, comorbid illness, and two to three days since last drink. Manifestations include agitated delirium, low-grade fever, tachycardia, hypertension, diaphoresis, and nausea and vomiting. With this, you'll see associated hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and generalized seizures. When conducting a history, ask the patient if they have any psychiatric comorbidities. Also ask if they have a history of liver-related problems, pneumonia, pancreatitis, traumatic brain injury, epilepsy, or seizures. Ask if they have a family history of drinking or psychiatric disorders. For social history, ask the patient, do they drink? How long have they drank? Uh, how much do they drink on a weekly or daily basis? What type of alcohol do they drink? And when their last drink was? If you get answers to these questions, it might be necessary to perform a cage analysis, which we'll discuss in a minute. Physical exam may reveal hepatomegaly, central obesity, odor from sweat or breath, findings from the CEWA scale, which we'll discuss in another slide. A CAGE analysis is used to determine the probability of alcohol abuse. The questions for a CAGE analysis are as follows. C. Have you ever felt you ought to cut down on your drinking? A. Have people annoyed you by criticizing your drinking? G. Have you ever felt bad or guilty about your drinking? E. Have you ever had a drink first thing in the morning to steady your nerves or get rid of a hangover? This is considered an eye-opener. Two yes answers indicates probable alcohol abuse and warrants further assessment. The Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment, or CEWA scale, is used to assess alcohol withdrawal. I'll provide you with a copy of this, but for these purposes I'll discuss the criteria and the results. The criteria on this assessment scale include nausea, vomiting, anxiety, sweats, tactile and visual disturbances, tremors, agitation, orientation, auditory disturbances, and headache. Whenever you rate the CEWA scale, an answer 0 to 9 indicates absent or minimal withdrawal, and you want to begin prophylactic treatment at greater than 8. 10 to 19 indicates mild to moderate withdrawal, and greater than 20 indicates severe withdrawal. Laboratory analysis of the alcoholic may reveal the following. With your complete metabolic panel, you may find a low magnesium, low potassium, low sodium, increased liver, liver function tests, especially ALT, and an increased anion gap. Your CBC may reveal decreased or increased white blood cells and anemia. Your urinalysis may show ketonuria. Your urine drug screen may show polysubstance use. Uh, you may find increased triglycerides, an increased gamma-glutamyl transferase, or GGT, is a relatively good indicator of alcoholism. The most definitive biomarker for chronic alcoholism is something known as the carbohydrate deficient transferrin, or CDT. This isn't seen very commonly, but a value of greater than 20 units indicates greater than 60 milligrams per day over 7 to 10 days of alcohol ingestion. Nursing diagnoses for the alcoholic patient may include the following. Risk for injury, ineffective coping, 
risk for infection, ineffective denial, dysfunctional family processes, and imbalanced nutrition less than body requirements. For risk for injury, you want to assess the level of disorientation to determine requirements for safety, obtain a drug history and UDS, maintain a quiet environment with reduced stimuli to prevent agitation, observe behaviors frequently, for instance, doing a CEWA scale every two hours and vital signs Q15 minutes initially, or maybe one-on-one -on -one therapy. Seizure precautions are another important aspect of risk for injury. You want to remove potentially harmful objects from access, frequently orient the patient to reality and their surroundings. Benzodiazepines mimic central nervous system depressant effects of alcohol by stimulating GABA receptors with an added benefit of protection against seizures. Medications that you may see be used include chlorodiazepoxide or Librium, diazepam or Valium, and lorazepam or Ativan. Phenytoin or Dilantin can be used for prevention of seizure activity. For imbalanced nutrition, monitor the patient's eyes and nose, fluid and electrolyte balance, and encourage PO intake. IV fluids may be used, including a banana bag, which replaces folate and thiamine, and or D5 normal saline. Thiamine is a standard for DTs because manifestations mask Wernicke's encephalopathy. It's recommended to take 100 milligrams daily, and this can be given IV or IM. Magnesium sulfate is another standard, and this, of course, replaces the magnesium loss. The alcoholic patient is at risk for infection because alcohol interferes with the liver's ability to synthesize proteins. As a result, the immune system is compromised. In addition, chronic alcoholics have decreased production, function, and movement of white blood cells. Monitor the patient for signs and symptoms of infection. Hand hygiene is always the best practice, and provide the patient with protein and nutrient-rich meals and supplementation. Ineffective denial is defined as the conscious or unconscious attempt to disavow the knowledge or meaning of an event to reduce anxiety or fear, but leads to a detriment in health. For patients with this diagnosis, develop rapport and a trusting relationship and be honest. Convey acceptance using statements such as, it's not you, but your behavior that is unacceptable. This promotes dignity and self-worth. Provide infor information to correct misconceptions. Identify recent maladaptive behaviors or situations. The first step in decreasing the use of denial is for the patient to see the relationship between substance use and personal problems. Use confrontation with caring. Do not allow the patient to fantasize about their lifestyle. Do not accept the use of rationalization or projection. Offer immediate positive recognition and reinforcement of the patient's expressions of insight gained. Ineffective coping is defined as the inability to form a valid appraisal of stressors, inadequate choices of practiced responses, and or the inability to use available resources. For this diagnosis, set limits on maladaptive behavior. Encourage verbalization of feelings, fears, and anxieties. Answer questions and explain the effects of substance abuse on the body. Explore options and coping mechanisms such as AA, physical exercise, relaxation, or meditation. Provide positive reinforcement for evidence of gratification delayed appropriately. Encourage the patient to be independent in self-care. Positive feedback for independent decision-making should be given. For the diagnosis of dysfunctional family processes, you can do the following. Review the family history. Explore roles of family members, circumstances involving alcohol use, strengths, and areas of growth. Explore how family members have coped with the patient's addiction through the use of denial, repression, rationalization, hurt, loneliness, or projection. Determine the family's understanding of the current situation and previous methods for coping with life's problems and assess family member functioning. Determine the extent of enabling behaviors and provide information about behaviors and addictive disease characteristics for both the user and non-user. Identify and discuss the possibility of sabotage behaviors by family members. These include secondary gain and role change. Assist partners in understanding that the only behavior that they can control is their own. 
involve family members in discharge planning. Finally, I would like to discuss two additional drugs that are associated with alcohol management. A camprosate, or camprol, reduces excessive NMDA activity during the onset of alcohol withdrawal. This reduces or prevents withdrawal-related neurotoxicity and has been shown to reduce the rate of relapse. Disulfiram, or anabuse, prevents elimination of acetaldehyde, leading to accumulation of acetaldehyde in the system. Acetaldehyde produces hangover symptoms from alcohol use.